Greetings friends and fellow aliens and thank you for tuning into this video and welcome to the channel. My name is David, I am an author, sometimes I'm on YouTube, I do stuff, and so here we are. <laughs> and I wanted to talk a little bit about writing. I actually got some writing content planned for the next month, kind of in the lead up to NaNoWriMo, uh, National Novel Writing Month, which is November, which I do not take part in. I really... Like, I'm very impressed by those of you who do, but like, I, I don't, I, I, that's not for me. <laughs> that whole very stressful scenario is not for me. I'll explain that some other time. For now, what I want to do is kick off some writing content with just a stack of questions. And I'm going to do these kind of in a, in a quick way. And uh, just to give you an idea of who I am as an author and as a creator when it comes to the written word and what I like to do, some of the, some little pieces of advice I may have from experience. Uh, and all of those things. That experience comes from self-publishing and publishing this book, The Caretaker, which is on Amazon, which you should absolutely check out. It's got a pile of awesome reviews and it's really good. I've had, I've had good success with the novel. People really, really enjoy it. I really enjoyed writing it and I'm working on the sequel, sort of. And so there's a lot going on. And uh, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of an idea of how I got from point A to point B through uh, some some just random author type questions. If you enjoy this video and this type of content, please like, subscribe, hit the bell, and all those kinds of things. You're gonna see you're gonna be seeing some shorts from me. Uh, you'll be seeing some other videos, some a little bit longer, and everything else, uh, just to attack all the all the writing stuff and the creating kind of stuff and the mindset that goes with being that kind of creator because that is also really tricky. We deal with all sorts of anxieties and imposter syndrome and I'm not good enough and I'm trash and so on and so forth. And look, you, we can get past all of those kinds of things. If you're sitting there and you want to create something, be it poetry, be it uh, finger painting, be it, uh, I don't know, a novel or what have you, uh, you encounter some of these things and I've encountered all of these things as well. So let's discuss, throw some questions in the comments and all that kind of stuff, your experiences as well and we'll see if we can help some people out with all this stuff. So, without any further ado, no more ado, all the doo-doo's gone, we're gonna get to the questions. What is the most difficult part of your writing process? Okay, so for me, the most difficult part of the writing process is actually having regular time to write. Um, there, life gets in the way for anybody, and you know, I, I I wish that I was the kind of writer that just had that as my my gig, if that was my thing and that's all I had to do and I didn't have to hold down a day job to pay the bills because writing does not pay the bills um, and and all those other things. It's, it's tricky for me. I find that my more creative times or at least the times where I'm a bit more focused are earlier in the morning. But you know, when you've got to log in and you've got to do work and all that kind of stuff that kind of makes it really difficult during the course of a day to get those in. By the time the afternoon hits, I'm tired. I also drive and I'm not really being that I'm not really exaggerating all that much. Nearly what averages to something like, I don't know, hundreds of miles a week. Uh, and that becomes very, very difficult on top of everything, because a lot of my life is spent with my butt in a car. And it's not really a great time to write. So there's that. So for me, that's my struggle. The, the most difficult thing is just finding that time. And when I do have the time, being in the mood and the headspace to be able to get the words down. It is tricky, tricky, tricky. I do the best I can to fit in some words when I want to. And when that inspiration hits, uh, I'm trying at least a little bit. I have tried to write a bit more at night. But man, by the time the day goes goes by, you're pretty exhausted. So this is a struggle and it's a struggle for everybody. But you know what? The words get down when the words want to get down and when they should. And so I try not to really worry about that too much. Don't look at advice on the internet that says that you have to sit down and write a thousand words every day, unless it's National Novel Writing Month, in which case yeah, you're kind of screwed. You got a whole month to look forward to that. Um, but that is not me as a writer. And I've learned to work around that. Question two, how long have you been writing or when did you start? Okay, so like that's really tricky because, you know, I always wrote as kind of as a kid, like middle school and high school, it was something that I was interested in and that I would try to do. And I always had good stories in my head that I wanted to get down and I wanted to tell. The first actual 
start to finish short story I wrote, which I actually have a single paper copy of because I had to print it. I actually did it on like a it was like a memory typewriter. So I wrote it out and then just like hit a button and it all printed out. And it's something like 30 pages or whatever. And it's a short story. Um, I happen to enjoy all things like vampires and werewolves and whatnot. And also, um, I always liked the movie Clerks and being from New Jersey that kind of hit like especially home for me. So my very first short story was a vampire in Wawa. It was basically Clerks with vampires. And so uh, I have a copy of it. It's incredibly embarrassing and the writing is absolutely terrible. Uh, And so at some point, I'll, I'll be, I'll have the motivation to get it, f- retype it and put it in an editor, clean it up and maybe just have that out as a story because it was actually pretty entertaining. I enjoyed it. And it was the first time I handed a work to somebody else and got really good feedback on it. So I don't know. That was kind of the bug that bit, I guess. Question three, what would you say to an author who wanted to design their own cover? Don't be that guy. Don't do that. Pay the money and get somebody who is used to doing illustrations for covers and everything else to do your cover for you. You should sock aside about 400 bucks for it. I'm just saying um, you can go on to Fiverr and look for people that actually just specialize in book covers. There's all kinds of options for you. Just let a pro do it. You're going to have it in a short period of time. You're not going to be struggling with like MS Paint trying to draw your character as a stick figure. Like, just just don't do that. Don't do that. Question four. What is a significant way your book has changed since the first draft? Okay, so maybe I'm a bit of an anomaly, but I do not write a first draft and then write a second draft and then write a third draft and so on and so forth, at least not in a conventional way. So what I typically do is I will write three, four, I'd say like four to five chapters. And then when I am on the fifth chapter, I go back through chapters one, two, and three, and I do a little bit of cleanup and just a little bit here and there, mix in some editing basically. And once I've got that and I've tightened it up a little bit, I'm like, okay, this is cool. I'm happy with it. Then I'll, I'll go on and I'll write chapter six, chapter seven, and then I'll go back and I'll do a little bit of editing on chapter four and chapter five. And then I'll write chapter eight, chapter nine, and I'll go back and I'll do a little bit of editing. And then eventually, once I'm around chapter 10, I go back to chapter one and I start to go through again. For me, it makes sense to build it this way. My thought process is all over the place and uh, it, it gets very tricky for me to just write the entire thing straight through because I forget. Um, There's things that I want to add here or there, things that I put in, in a later chapter. I'm like, Oh, I just need to tweak a little thing here or mention it, um, you know, in an earlier chapter to reference it. So I don't know. I mean, it changes greatly. So, you know, in, in total, I guess I'm really editing, you know, my initial chapters multiple, multiple times, uh, you know, to try and tighten them up and clean them up. And I do my own round of creative edits and then I do my own grammar edits. I do my own style edits and then I go back and do more creative edits and so on and so forth. So it's something that I'll do when I have like, you know, maybe a half hour to fool around with. And I can do a little bit of editing on a chapter, but I don't really have the time or the inclination to sit down and produce two to 3,000 words of the story. Question five, which of the characters do you relate to the most and why? Okay, so in The Caretaker, um, the main character is very much built off of me. So a lot of the experiences, a lot of the things that he Uh, has gone through or is feeling and everything else are just based on my experience in life in general. The times I've experienced pain, the times I've experienced joy, uh, the times I've experienced just the wonder at exploring something. And so for me, I relate to the main character, obviously a great deal. However, it's important to, to not only write a little bit of yourself in your characters, I think, but to be honest about it. And that's where some of my side characters come in because they have traits and things about them that I a lot of times strive for personally. And that creates an entire character arc for my main character and it sets up the side characters as well. So if I write a side character as being a particular way that my main character struggles with, it automatically creates 
a good bond between the two of them. And so I kind of approach it that way. But I'd say as far as relating to my characters, I relate to William St. Denis because I write William St. Denis as if he is me. Question six, what part of the book did you have the hardest time writing? So if I'm going to go through all this and figure which which part of it was the most difficult part for me to write. Oh, man. Honestly, it was like chapter two. Chapter two is called A Date with Destiny. And uh, if you read the book, you know what that chapter is about. And it kind of sets up everything for the remainder of the book. Um, obviously, the first chapter is instrumental in getting in setting the, the mood and the pacing. That second chapter is the one that kind of sets up everything. So what I found that I had to, to continually do is as I was writing it and the story was changing a little bit from what I had planned, I was constantly going back to that second chapter to just tweak the dialogue only a hair, like adding in a couple words here or there to provide those as something that was some foreshadowing for much, much later chapters 80,000 words later, essentially. So that's the one that I was always going back to and restructuring and redoing and redoing and redoing and everything else. And I really wanted to nail it because that what that sets up the emotional connection that William has. That is the basis for all of his actions throughout the entire novel. And it was really, really important to nail that piece. So if you read the book or reread the book and you are you are on chapter two, just know that there was there was a lot of work in that chapter, a lot of blood, sweat and tears, so to speak, uh, falling on the pages to get that one done. Blood because I cut myself on something, but it's fine. Question seven. What part of the book was the most fun to write? The whole thing was fun. I mean, really, the whole thing was fun in one way or another. Uh, but I'd say that for me, it was those scenes where I knew there would be a little bit of a surprise, a little wink and a nod to the reader in some way. So uh, when when William, spoiler alert for this, so if you haven't read the book, just like plug your ears for about 30 seconds. Uh, when William ends up traveling to meet love himself and that entire scene and their interactions, that part to me was just so much fun, so much fun to write. Uh, because I really enjoyed writing about the atmosphere and the scene and all the things going on in such a lighthearted way that actually had just a really ominous undertone to it. And I'd say my other favorite scenes were scenes where William was challenged, where the, that main character was challenged and he was forced to look at something that he found very difficult to look at or hard to understand or did not want to do. And so... Anytime he was challenged by another character, those were always really juicy, fun scenes to just kind of sink my teeth into. Uh, and for me personally, I love writing scenery. Uh, I love setting the mood and setting the stage. And I like talking about the lighting and the scents, uh, the smells that are in a place, um, how things are reflecting little. I mean, really just engaging all the senses, right? Like what, what does something feel like where he's if he's on cold pavement, what does it feel like when his blood is spilling out of him? Uh, you know how it's sticky and a little warm and like all those different kinds of things for me. That's like the best part of writing this kind of stuff. Uh, and also, I guess some of the dark humor because I've got some of the dark humor kicking around. So like, why can't we joke about this kind of stuff? We should. Question eight. What inspired the idea for your book? Believe it or not, this entire thing, all these words, all this work over the course of uh, more than a year, for sure, all of this came from a writing prompt on a little playing card. I had this card deck called the So deck. You can get them on Amazon or everything else. So like S-O dot dot dot. And it just asks questions and they're great questions for writing prompts and everything else. And so the one that I uh, encountered was what is the oldest item that you own? And I sat there and I thought about it and I'm thinking, well, there's like my dad's this thing or my grandfather's this thing. And like, I don't know, is that older than this thing or whatever? And I'm like, you know what? This is just stupid and boring. I don't need to write about it. I don't need to write about a family heirloom. Let me expand that question. This is what I did in my own head. What would the oldest object on earth be? And so it has to be something that is 
cosmically ancient is the way I saw it. Um, I know getting into like kind of not really cosmic horror, but like, you know, cosmic despair. I'm going to pull my pants up. My Cthulhu is showing, you know what I mean? That's not a metaphor for having like a tentacle for a penis. Anyway, it was a kind of question that I just kept thinking about and thinking about. And then I thought, well, it has to be, if there's an object that exists that is older than Earth itself, then that object has to be on some kind of a cosmic scale. What is on a cosmic scale? A cosmic scale, rather. Well, life, death, creation, um, entropy. Those are the things that have been around longer than than human civilization, uh, longer than, than any, anything, any organism on the planet. Stars were being born and dying long before Earth was around. And so that just really got me thinking in this huge, broad universe kind of way. And then I was like, well, that's cool. So let's pretend that this object embodies death itself. And if you had an object on Earth that represented the concept of death, what would it look like? What would it be? And who would have it? And that's how I came up with William St. Denis as the caretaker. The caretaker. So his job is to take care of what ends up looking like a blade, an old uh, knife. And that knife is death itself. And that's how he becomes the caretaker for death through all sorts of stuff. And this is the entire story. So you get the idea for it. It all stemmed from just a little writing challenge. I wrote about 500 words on it. What's the oldest item you own or you have? And I just ignored that and went oldest item ever. And then wrote a little scene that turned into the first chapter of the book. So there you go. Inspiration is like everywhere. You just got to be listening for it, really. Question number nine. How long did it take you to write this book? Uh, all right. So like straight writing time, it's really difficult to, to pin it down. But I'd say roughly about a year, um, you know, and, and again, I mean, with kids and a job and everything else going on, it's it's difficult for me to sit down and just have that dedicated writing time. I just don't really work that way. So I wrote on the weekends when I could. I did a little bit of editing at night here and there. Sometimes uh, as I was sitting, sometimes as I was sitting in bed, looking at my phone and just rereading something that I wrote like the week before and just doing a little bit of editing on it. Um, you know, when I could, when the, when the mood hit, when I was able to just do a little bit, I did a little bit. For me, it was important to take the baby steps and get to the finish line. All I wanted to do was complete it. I really didn't care about how long it took Honestly, if you're struggling with that question, you're really not paying attention to yourself. So how long does it take to write a book? It takes as long as the book needs to be written. Think of it that way. And that's you trying to be at your best, working around life in general, and making sure that you're focused on telling the story and not just cranking out something quickly to try and make a few bucks because newsflash, you won't. Question number 10. If you were to write a spinoff about a side character, which side character would you pick? There's a bunch of characters in here and I was thinking about this question and it's really, really hard for me to, to come up with, to come up with like even a, a hierarchy of who I would want to write a side story about. Um, the first one that pops into my head is probably Duncan. Duncan is introduced a little bit into the book as um, a kind of foil. He's the logical voice for a, my very emotional main character. And so for those of you keeping track with the whole MBTI thing, William is written as an INFJ or at least a lot of INFJ tendencies and Duncan is written as an INTJ. And from personal ex personal experience, those two work really well together, but also can irritate the crap out of each other on a regular basis because one is much more logical than the other. And those different languages make it really interesting. And everything in life is about balance. And so I put Duncan in there specifically to get under William's skin and to help him grow and see things in a different way and mature out of his very immature view that he starts out. When the book starts in the first chapter, William is pretty much full on nihilist. And by the end of it, he starts to come around. And a lot of that is due to Duncan. 
Duncan was a blast to write. He was super fun because I could be sarcastic. I could be a little angry about everything. Um, he's he's a character based in rules, and I think it would be really cool and something that I that I think about um, wanting to do would be to create a stack of short stories just for Duncan and his life prior to the events of this book and just some of how he got to where he was. Uh, I would I would love to write that story. One of my other characters that that I really, really enjoyed writing was Emmanuel. And I think an older character like him, who's allied with everything involved with love and feeling would be a real blast to write about um, because of the different experiences and the different timeline of his life. There's really no character in the book that I wouldn't want to write more about. But if I had to write a spinoff that was dedicated a little bit longer, Duncan gets my vote. Question number 11. Have you ever traveled as research for your book? I have not traveled as research for the book, but I have done a fair amount of traveling. I have lived on the East Coast of the United States, I've lived in the Midwest, and I've lived on the West Coast of the US. So, and I've driven the entire length. I have seen a lot, I've experienced a lot. I have been to other countries. I've been to Canada, I've been to Croatia, I've been to Italy. I was in what was Croatia and when it was Yugoslavia, I was to a country that doesn't exist anymore, which is kind of cool too. Uh, so I've seen a lot of things. And when I write, I write from that knowledge and that perspective. But if I can't get it, and if I'm if I feel like I'm struggling a little bit with how to describe a place or a scene or a feeling in a particular place, a lot of times I'll just go onto Google Maps and I'll do like the satellite view and I zoom in. Um, in book two, uh, I did just that for a particular scene. I, I was traveling in Boston a few years ago and I was down this weird little alley on this side street that was just like, I don't even know why the side street was there. And there were these set of doors, these giant like oak doors that were like 15 feet tall with these huge uh, cast iron gargoyle head knockers on it. No sign anywhere as to what this building was. And let me tell you, I took a picture and that picture just had my head spinning of like what is in this place that it's got this cool like ancient looking door on the middle of a street next to a place that was like for pancakes and stuff because I was there for breakfast. So I knew as soon as I snapped that picture that that picture is going to be in a story. And sure enough, it is a location in the second book. To remind myself of what it was like, I went on to Google Maps. I found it again by looking for the pancake place that I went to and uh, and then looking around on Street View like a, like a lost tourist, but just online and then understanding what that alley looks like and what the buildings look like, where the shadows were and all those different things. And that helped me write the scene. So I'd say, look, if you can't travel for the book and you want to write about some other place, go there online. Super easy. You can find all sorts of people vlogging about any different place, just like a little travel vlog, and you get a sense for what it's like, what the people are like, and everything else. Yeah, maybe you can't hit the the smells and the tactile feeling of it, but it's a huge help for a writer that wants to write in locations outside of your own neighborhood. Question 12. When you're writing an emotional or difficult scene, how do you set the mood? I like to light some candles and pour a little champagne. No, different kind of mood. Um, so setting the mood for a scene that's, let's call it emotional or difficult. Um, I mean, I, I definitely prepare myself with music and that's very important to me. Um, you know, just to, to kind of set the stage, I'm, I'm mood driven. So by having some music that's a little bit more depressing for a scene that's a bit more emotional, I'll do that. Something a little bit more uplifting, I'll do that. So I'd say that for setting the mood, I, I prepare myself mentally for a scene that I know is going to be difficult to write emotionally. And then I try to nail it that day of when I know I got to write it. Question number 13. How did you celebrate when you finished your book? That depends on how you define finished. I mean, wrote the last word. I didn't really celebrate all that much because after that, it's all the editing and it's all the formatting and it's all the cover art and the copyright, like the, all the, all the other stuff that's involved, which is kind of a drag, but I'd say, I, I mean, I probably like got myself my favorite sandwich or some such thing. Like that's something normal to do. Um, you know, and certainly by the time I got the book and it was in my hands and I opened it up, 
And I was like, well, that's that. So really at that point, like I'm done, I got to let go. And I just got to celebrate and celebrate getting it out into the world and hope people like it. Question number 14. Do you play music while you write? And if so, what's your favorite? I can, I can go through this book with you and point out different chapters and tell you exactly what I was listening to and according to the mood of the chapter. Much of my writing is done to, um, I, I mean, honestly, I probably listened to Tool more than I listened to anything else when I was writing this book uh, because it's just great mood music. The songs are longer, maybe not like a ton of words, or at least it blends in a little bit because I don't want to be too distracted. Um, you know, like I don't think I could write a book listening to like, I don't know, Barbie Girl. Number 15, if you're planning a sequel, can you share a tiny bit about it? or about your plans for it. Yes, I can. So in terms of the sequel, this first book is The Caretaker, and that is William St. Denis. That is his role in this supernatural world. Book two is called The Steward. And in book two, William is paying for all of the heartache that he went through in the first book. Now look, I put the guy through the ringer, right? In terms of emotionally and the story and everything else. And... The way I wrapped up the end of the book, it wrapped up on his adrenaline, pushing through those last moments of everything that he had to do. And while it was very emotional and a release for him, something that I've known from experience is that mourning works in weird ways and grief works in weird ways. And William needed to grieve. And he didn't really have that opportunity at the end of the book. So this second one, I really wanted to kick off with a lot of his tortured mind over everything that happened with the first book. So he is not in a good mental state. Um, he is he is ripe for making terrible decisions, for doing terrible things, for being absolutely confused about where he is and where his life is and everything. In book one, I put the guy through a lot and you got that story. In book two, I'm really going to put him through the ringer and, uh, and play with him coming out of that and learning from it and understanding and, and, and accepting um, his responsibility in the world and some of the mistakes that he's made. And so that's the direction that it's going. Yes, there are going to be more concepts in this book and I can't wait to reveal that kind of information to you, but I can't right now. Um, the concepts, that's the juicy part. I can't give you any of those. Um, but you already know from the first book that love is in there and death is in there and so on and so forth. You're going to see some of that old crowd and you're going to see plenty of new. And so I'll give you, I'll give you one. I'll give you one. Just be prepared for karma. Karma's a bitch. Well, folks, thank you for tuning in, and I hope this was fun for you. It was fun for me to talk a little bit about the project, and just for you to get to know me as an author and some of my process and my things. Like I said, more writing content coming at you, so if you're gearing up for NaNoWriMo, I hope you'll stick around, and uh, hopefully some of these things inspire you. If you're just interested in writing, never have, look, you can do it. You can get the words down. You are a writer and I want to help you and help you get it done. So hang out here and hang around for all those different things. Um, if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so by checking out the links that are below. I have a, uh, a membership group and so you can become a member and join the page. It's a couple bucks and you get the custom emojis and all that kind of stuff. And also we have a Facebook group that we're, that our members are hanging out in, which is super fun too. So thank you. Thank you for tuning into this one and I'm sure I will see you very, very soon.